Welcome. Hello. Good morning. Hi, everyone. I hope you're ready to oscillate today or pulse together with me. So I welcome you to uh, Systems Biology. here at the Weizmann Institute. <laughs> in Israel. Let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> Thank God we're in Israel. <sighs> the land of Zion. It's a very special place. And up to now, in the course, we talked about Take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> Shalom, welcome. <laughs> uh, we've been talking about um, pretty simple dynamical behaviors. We're talking about, let's say, uh, genes that regulate other genes, and then they, when a signal comes, the regulated gene starts increasing with a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> slowly approaches its steady state level with exponential, you know, the exponential dynamics. Um, nice and steady. We talked about uh, feed-forward loops that cause delays. An incoherent feed-forward loop caused a pulse. Remember that? Pulse. But just one pulse uh, after a step change in input. Um, we talked about uh, brachial chemotaxis, about signal transduction two component systems, et cetera, et cetera. Today I'd like to talk about a field that's really emerging and in some way changing the way we think about cell regulation inside cells, about oscillators and pulsars that occur in gene regulation circuits. All right? A topic that, let's say, if 10 years ago, um, a lot, a lot of what we're going to say was just not known, unknown biology. So it's very new. And correspondingly, I think our understanding is still very fresh. And, uh, and we'll talk about how things oscillate and pulse, and then we'll talk, try to think about why. That's really something uh, where we can think together. We're not clear, and uh, we know all the answers. Okay, so. So let's, let's get into it. Let's talk about oscillations in biology. Yeah, I drew here the, the day, you know, the sun goes up and down, and the moon over the month. This is a different period, right? This is, this is 24 hours. The moon has a different period. Uh, 28 days, right? Is that right? Something like that? The lunar calendar, full, yeah? And we have this uh, harmonic oscillators. Physicists, when we talk about oscillators, we often think of harmonic oscillators, like the pendulum. Um, so there's definitely rhythm in nature. And there's rhythm inside us. kinds of rhythms. We like to listen to music, right? Certain range of uh, rhythms. Not too far from our heartbeat, actually. Um, so oscillatory phenomenon in, in cells, uh, there's the classic ones, which, is, which are uh, cell cycle and circadian rhythms. I'll just describe that. So, cell cycle, cell grows, doubles its size, and divides. Mm -hmm. Bacteria or, or eukaryotic cells grows, doubles its size, and divides. Right? And there's, uh, there's different stages in the cell cycle uh, of uh, cells, like uh, eukaryotic cells. You have um, 
you have, uh, I, I don't remember these names. This is G, G phase, right? Who, who's a biologist here? Raise your hand if you're a biologist. All right. Who's going to volunteer to tell me the names of the cell cycle stages? G1. G1, which is what happens there. Thank you, Sheila. G1 is growth. OK, then? S. S, which is? What happens in S? Yeah. DNA synthesis, right? What else? Then? G2. G2, it's another, another phase of growth. Then M, which is cell division, right? Inside it, there's all these stages where the chromosomes get aligned and separated and the furrow created. And the, for, 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 um, for human cells, let's say, the, the period of the cycle can be, let's say, 8 hours to 24 hours to, to never. Like some cells ne just don't divide. They're stuck in G1. So stuck in G1. Um, like, let's say, our muscles. We have basically the same amount of muscle cells throughout our life. And they don't divide. Um, neurons in our brain usually don't divide, even though there's some of them that die, that get replenished, die, and divide. But that's a cell cycle. And inside the cell, there are certain transcription factors like E2F, whose activity um, oscillates. So this is one cell cycle, and. This transcription factor, for example, could regulate when it's above some threshold, let's say S phase genes, and say, tell the cell, let's say, OK, replicate its DNA or divide or something like that. It's a nice deep sigh of relief. We're going to periodically take nice deep sighs of relief at a certain period. <laughs> yeah, actually, stochastic, this will be an example of a stochastic pulses because we, we, it's not a periodic thing. OK, so that's one kind of um, oscillator. Another kind of oscillator is called the circadian clock, which uh, means that um, gene expression oscillates with 24-hour periodicity. So a lot of our cells have a clock that can uh, basically it's like it's like the clock on the wall. It's a 24-hour clock, and this has sir. <laughs> Several interesting periods, several interesting features. It, um, in the dark, it gets reset by light and temperature signals. So in the dark, it actually has, um, it's, it's off. It, let's say it, ha it can have a 25-hour <coughs> or 23-hour periodicity. It's, that's called circadian. Circa means almost, almost a day. Uh, but it gets entrained by light. So if you have a uh, light going on off with 24-hour periodicity, just like the sun, uh, it kind of gets to this 24-hour periodicity. It's uh, temperature compensated, which means it keeps its period despite changes in temperature. I just want to uh, remind you that 10 percent, 10 degree change in temperature results typically in twofold change in biochemical rates, up or down, twofold change up or down. And so you try to think of a clock whose period is exact when you change the numbers on the arrows by a factor of two, up or down. So, um, that's an interesting question. We won't get into it, except that I think recent evidence suggests that clocks are made such that their biochemistry, in fact, of each reaction is temperature independent in a certain way. Uh, so again, you have a transcription factor in this clock. It's, uh, there's a transcription factor activity that uh, has a 24-hour periodicity. And, um, and there's some genes made in the morning, some genes made in the afternoon, some genes made at night, genes uh, 
when we're sleeping, when we're awake, our metabolism really gets affected by the time of day. Uh, that's why we have jet lag. Uh, when our inner clock doesn't match the, the, the light clock outside, it takes us a day or two to match the phases. Um, and that's... These are um, periodic oscillations. Uh, they've been studied for quite a few decades. Um, Maybe to even bacteria have circadian rhythms, uh, like photosynthetic bacteria, and there's um, bec recently there's just a three protein system, a three protein circuit that when you pre purify them and put them in a test tube, they have the 24-hour oscillation. So from uh, the chi ABC system, it's called. So it's now possible to study a very simple circadian clock. Um, and figure out what its circuitry is. Um, proteins phosphorylate each other and have a kind of, it's just a three, three component clock. That's uh, it's pretty beautiful. Um, and then, so these were, let's say, well-known oscillators. There's also some, some oscillations in me metabolism, calcium oscillations, etc. But then about 10 years ago, it was discovered that um, a friendly transcription factors, X, Y, Z, that we talked about in this course. Some of them also show um, oscillations inside the cell. And these oscillations now are um, we have to deal with them. I want to first. We need to understand how, how is it that cells can keep time, cell cycle, and circadian clocks, and also understand how some genes uh, and why they show oscillations. So I'm going to talk about just one classic one, p53. Uh, every biologist here has heard of this, this protein because it's so famous. It's probably the world's most famous protein. Uh, who's heard of p53 here? Let's look around. So it's about half the class. And it's called the guardian of the genome. <coughs> because it, um, it basically, you can say it kills the cell if the DNA is damaged. <coughs> and that's, that's good for us because uh, we don't want the cell to turn into a cancer cell. And indeed, uh, I think you can say that most, most cancers have a mutations in this transcription factor, p53. And that's, how, that's why it's got such a big interest. It's, a, it's what's called a tumor suppressor. It's in your, in your cells and it protects you from cancer. And one of the things that happens in cancer is there's a mutation in this p53 that makes it not work properly. And then, or at least in one of its friends that in its circuit there's a, there's a mutation. And then uh, after P53 is mutated, there's a lot of uh, rearrangements in the DNA and all kinds of things happen that help the cancer cells grow at, at our expense. So uh, in, in uh, classic uh, molecular biology, studied proteins by averaging millions of cells. So for what you would do is you would um, take millions of cells, many, many cells, put on some, let's say, gamma radiation that damages the DNA. Then you take out the protein, proteins from the cells, all the different proteins. P53 is among them. And then you run them on a gel to separate them by their mass. So this is mass now. The bigger they are, mass. The bigger they are, the slower they run through this obstacle course called a gel under an electric field, right? And now you have a lot of all these proteins there. Then you want to see your P53 just out of all these proteins. So you, you take an antibody 
antibody against p53. So this antibody recognizes only p53, and you and you and you color this antibody somehow, and then you only see that band, okay. because the antibody only binds to the p53. This is 53 kilodaltons. That's the weight of p53, by the way. That's why it's called p53. 53. Th it weighs like 53,000 hydrogen atoms. All right. That's how biology. When I came into biology, <laughs> it's good background music for my story, my personal story. <laughs> When I was a young PhD student, not unlike yourselves <laughs> in physics, and I said to my advisor, David Mukamel, I just read an amazing book on biology. It blew my mind. How could this be? Matter behaving like this. Uh, uh, working so precisely under thermal noise. Structures created, destroyed. I have to work on this. And he said, um, "It's just a passing phase. You'll grow over it." <laughs> and then I, I kept bugging him until he couldn't stand me anymore. And he says, "Get out of my, get out of my sight. Go to the biology building. Find somebody who could, who, to talk to. You know." And I came to uh, Tsiki, Tsiki Kam, who also used to be a physicist. And he sent me to the hardcore biology lab. You'll see it then. And I, I would run these gels, Western blots. And um, they're really great, because you can see, either you see a band or you don't. It's very logical thinking. So you run a control. It's, it's, very, very, uh, it's a very robust experiment. It's called a Western blot. And Nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> and so you, let's say, you, 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 you run the, here, here are the, here's the cells after, after gamma radiation. And here are the cells with no gamma radiation. Okay. And you see this band is bigger and like heavier. And so you say, okay, P53 levels went up in the cells that had gamma radiation. Their DNA is chopped up, P53 responds, and you can even kind of quantitate it by uh, doing some image analysis on these bands and stuff. And you can say it went up ten t tenfold or whatever. Okay? And that's very powerful. That's how we know most of what we know about signaling molecules. Are. And you can even do time courses. So I, I put the gamma radiation, time t equals zero, and then every, uh, let's say, 30 minutes, I take, it, I take the cells, and every 30 minutes I or, or maybe it's more appropriately, I take a lot of cells, I gamma zap them, and every 30 minutes I, I take another batch, and pick it up, take out the proteins, make juice out of it, run <laughs> and run in different bands. And so I have a time course. And, and uh, this is the time zero, so then the time, let's say, one hour, I have a bigger band and a bigger band, and, and so on. Okay, my gel runs like this, and I can have a time course. Okay. And when you do that, you notice that the bands are kind of shaking around a little bit, but then you say, maybe it's the inaccuracy of my gel, because you have to pipette it in, you know, with, you take the pipetter. And you load it, it has this blue, you load it with some blue color so you can see what you're doing. And you, does anybody here ever do, still do Western blots? Yeah. Okay, let's pick up your hand if you do. Okay, it's still a big technique. And you're never sure <laughs> if you put it, is it true? If you like load it a little more, a little less. You have your control band, maybe here's a protein gap, DH is supposed to be constant or something, so you can normalize that. But then you can see some wiggles. And let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. It's estimated, let's say, there's 30,000 papers with, uh, on P53. Let's say around 2,000. So it's a lot, of, a lot of work, a lot of knowledge, et cetera. And then Arnie, Arnie Levine, who's the person who discovered P53, basically, comes to Moshe and is working on P53 here, and says, look, I've noticed that the bands kind of go up and down. 
and what's going on here? And uh, we see it again and again. It's, uh, and Moshe Oren says, look, um, let's talk to uh, Uri Alon. He's just arrived. He's a new faculty member. He does this computer thing, <laughs> so maybe he can help us understand it. And we looked at it, and really, it, it looked like it w went up and down. Then uh, when uh, Galit Lav came to do a postdoc with me, uh, we thought this was interesting. And so what she did was uh, try to do a single cell experiment. So what's the difference between a single cell experiment and an experiment like this? Is that here you average over millions of cells. Right? And if you want to see what's happening at single cells, uh, you need to do these new kind of experiments with green fluorescent protein to look at individual cells. And uh, what I was thinking then, I must admit, is that what we will see here is that when you raise, when you have this gamma radiation, you're going to see damped oscillations like this. Why did I think that? Is because uh, in engineering, a lot of times, if you want to now, like our, we talked a lot about temperature control. Let's say I want to control the temperature here. So I change the temperature. I make power to the heater. The heater goes up. I want to heat the temperature. Sometimes it's, if you want to have fast response time, it's optimal in engineering to make it fast, overshoot, and then go, back, go down. Okay? Sometimes that's called damped oscillation. So you, you gain speed, but you lose by not having the you have to oscillate around the precise temperature. And there's certain optimal designs for that, the trade-offs between the, eigenval the, the eigenvalues on the right side of the plane. And, 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 and. So I thought, let's look at that. That was the, that was the, so in our project, this is the question, this was the answer. And we started going, and of course, we got stuck in the cloud, we didn't understand what was going on, and we found something different. What we found was, this is the cloud, right? It stands between the known and the unknown. What we found was the P53, now in individual cells, right? You see, you make a movie. Actually, what she built was uh, two color cells. And P53 has a, a negative, negative uh, regulator that, that causes, so she connected this to green and this to Red, let's say, but then we didn't have green and red. So it's actually, this was, I think, yellow, and this was cyan. This was before green and red. <laughs> red, yellow, and cyan. <laughs> we still didn't have the red. Now there's the red. Because this, this, these proteins come from jellyfish, and other things have been engineered now, so you have different colors. And you can see, actually, this was really cool. You can look at it with your own eyes. And what you can see is, after gamma radiation, P53 goes into the nucleus, and then it's anti, it's, it's anti guy, MDM2 goes into the nucleus, and then P53 disappears from the nucleus, and then MDM2 disappears from the nucleus. And this was with the, the six hour period. Now, Galit, we didn't have an autofocus microscope back then, so she had to focus the microscope by hand every 15 minutes or something. Now, suppose you want to do a 24 hour movie and focus by hand every 15 minutes. What happens to you? <laughs> You bring your husband for support, <laughs> right? Or you, everyone, anything you can, but it's really hard. So she couldn't get much more than a few oscillations. But then later, we, she started her own lab in Harvard. She bought, built a microscope with autofocus. She could look for days. And it's true, what she found is that uh, P53 after gamma radiation, so here you put the gamma, like this. This is single cells, right? And with the six-hour periodicity, as I said. Now, I drew here, let's draw it a little bit more accurately. It's not exactly equal pulses. The po pulses have, a, have accurate period, but noisy amplitude. Also, The low gamma levels and high gamma levels basically the fraction of oscillating cells increases with signal. Signal here is gamma, but 
not the amplitude or period. That's to say, you can ask, OK, I have here a system that responds to a signal. So I increase the signal, what will happen? Maybe its amplitude will increase, bigger pulses. Or maybe the period, maybe more pulses. No. What happens in the system is the fraction of cells that oscillate changes. Uh, and this was uh, quite shocking, actually. And um, 2000, so this is the lab at all. Nature Genetics. 2004. So maybe this is the 10th year anniversary of that paper. Uh, at the same time, there was another paper on a different protein, NF kappa B. It's an immune response protein. And same story, looking at single cells. And you can see that it has this um, oscillatory pattern. In there, it's a big pulse followed by a series of smaller pulses like that. And also, a fraction of cells uh, oscillating depends on the signal. So those are two. Um, and then many, many, many more were found like that. Uh, so we definitely have a situation on our hands that uh, you need to look at single cells. You need to deal with the uh, oscillatory proteins. A uh, situation a little bit uh, even more complex. P53 uh, has uh, oscillate oscillations for gamma damage, but has um, graded non-oscillatory response to UV damage. So there's two ways, please, to damage your DNA. Gamma radiation, um, or you know, these high energy particles, and they cause double strand DNA breaks. So you, now you have to you have to fix them. Yeah, otherwise, you can't uh, you can't replicate your DNA. So you have to glue them together. Nice deep sigh of relief. Shalom. Uh, UV damage causes uh, another kind of other kind of damage. It doesn't break the DNA. It's lower energy, but it causes uh, ke chemical modifications, like when we get a sunburn. Um, we also get gamma because of uh, cosmic radiation all the time. And in response to gamma radiation, uh, UV radiation, um, so here we put UV radiation. It shows a, a smooth signal, just like we just like we learned in this course, right? shows some kind of uh, accumulation. And uh, let's say this is high, and at low UV, something like this. So all cells basically show a nice, logical, non-oscillatory uh, response. So the same protein responds in two different dynamical ways to diff two different signals. Right, so you can say that you have your P53 here, you have gamma and UV, two different signals, and gamma causes it to oscillate, and UV causes it to have this graded response. And the, the thing is that it turns out, according to Galit Lab's work, that the dynamic nature of what P53 is doing determines which genes it activates. P53 is a transcription factor. Biologists say P53 so often, it turns into one word, 53. Like the 53, 50, it's like, so, <laughs> so you can, uh, so genes A and genes B, let's say. So in other words, this is what's called, now, dynamical multiplexing. Which means that uh, the same protein, the way it behaves dynamically, let's say oscillatory or graded, determines, for, if it's oscillating, it turns on some genes. And if it's graded, it turns on other genes. And that means the downstream of this dynamical system, 
there's a reader, there's a, let's say genes that, there's a reader that only, let's say, um, it's like a filter that picks up oscillations for some genes and a filter that uh, wipes out the oscillations for other genes because there's a filter based on a gene circuit. So we need to figure out now all this, um, all this biology and uh, maybe I, I should say that electronics, you know, at a certain point went from direct current to alternating current, DC to AC, and all kind of digital electronics, which has a clock, and electronics found out that it's much better to use a, a clock, oscillations, in order to do computations. And it could be that cells have discovered the same idea. Needless to say, neurons pulse also, and but we're not dealing with neurons here in this course. Okay, so let's take a nice deep breath at this point because we're going to need it, because things get even weirder uh, when you uh, look at uh, some, some time after P53. We discovered that, okay, so you can say these, these, pul these tr trains of periodic, noisy periodic pulses, maybe in a certain way not so different from the cell cycle and the circadian clock we're used to because they're periodic. They have a period. We can say six hours or something. But then it turned out that there's some transcription factors in the cell that uh, show a different behavior. And, and you can, the best way to define it is the stochastic pul pulse pulses. So I'll try to describe this to you. Again, all this was invisible before you could look at, at single cells, li single living cells over time. So we took classic transcription factors and it turned out to be different from when you look at individual cells. Um, yeah? If you, look like a, if you look at the population of cells, isn't it just possible to see the mean of this uh, oscillation? So you still see an oscillation. Yeah, so the question is, let's look at this P53. We, we have different cells. The one is doing this, and the other one is doing this. And now if we take a million like this and we average them, we should see a strong band, weak band, strong band, weak band, strong band, weak band. And then on millions of cells, you should be able to see that. Is that your question? Yeah. Correct. So. And indeed, you can. You can if you look carefully and you do very good gels, you can see. The thing is that um, the oscillations, I said they have an accurate period, but they're not absolutely accurate. So some cells have five hours, some cells have seven hours. And that means they go out of phase. So going out of phase, so if you, if you means that, um, what you actually see, let's see, a, a strong band, a little bit weaker band, and then all these bands later basically are the same because you start averaging out these phase differences. Is this a way to sync everything? And you do synchronize them by the gamma. So you take this gamma and that synchronizes them. They start going up. But still they go out of phase quickly enough. So that you can see it, you can see it on, by eye. And indeed that was how Arne Levine picked it up from gels and you can look at if you look back at papers you see you can see you can see the like on the average it looks like this individual cells looks like this for one cell this for another cell this for a third cell and that's why they start they start smearing up plus it's all writing on a background it's not like going down to zero so. So uh, that's why this it was very difficult to determine from averages. How do you know that the response to the gamma radiation is equal in different phases of the cell cycle? Right, so, the, so, we are, uh, so Cheryl's question is about that we have this oscillation with six hour period and then we have the 24 or say 20 hour cell cycle period. And also maybe the circadian 24 hours, so maybe it depends on what time of the day we do the experiment. All these things affect together. You said the gamma radiation synchronizes. Right. Correct. Correct. Good point. Good point. Right. So right. If we have we have a population of cells, they quickly go out of phase. Right. 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 Right.
we say if they have a different amplitude or period or something in different parts of the cell cycle, that would ha help us, to, even though we're synchronizing them with gamma, if, uh, the, the, the pulses will be different for each cell and that will help desynchronize them. So one way to maybe address that is to do two kinds of synchronization. First, synchronize the cell cycle by, let's say, putting a blocker, press everyone in G, then taking away that blocker, they start, <laughs> they start and then hit the poor cells with gamma. And see, so I, I think the answer is known, I just don't know it, how much, because uh, you can imagine that um, when you're replicating your DNA S phase, you might be more sensitive to DNA damage than when you're not replicating your DNA, like in G phase, and so it makes a lot of sense. So we are also need to think about multiple oscillators at the same time. Um, so these pulses, the pulses, uh, the stochastic pulses, uh, they look more like this. So this is uh, this is the yeast. This is the nucleus. Transcription factor called crazy one, and when you couple it to GFP. It's not called crazy one because it pulses. It's, it's called crazy one for a different reason, but it's also crazy, it's dynamics. This is crazy one in the nucleus, okay? Crazy one in the nucleus. It goes into the nucleus in order to turn on gene expression. It looks like this. Okay, that's for, let's say, low signal. Cal like calcium is the signal here. And for high, high signal, it looks like so this in this case we, what we have here is kind of FM frequency modulation more pulses more pulses per unit time if signal is high okay, so that's a different strategy and the pulses are stereotyped, they have a fixed amplitude, and also fixed duration, but their, their probability so it increases with signals. So that's the way it's encoded here. It's FM kind of uh, situation. All right? And uh, MSN2. Other yeast transcription factors are the same. Sometimes you have two transcription factors that regulate the same gene and they both pulse and then the action has to do with the correlations between these pulses. Let's say if one is activated and the other is a repressor, the gene is activated in, in the anti-correlated, like when one is a nucleus and the one isn't. isn't. So there's a whole range now of, uh, of these simultaneous pulse trains to, to think about and to, whether they're correlated or not, etc. Um, okay, so we're talking here about the phenomenology and uh, here at Weizmann there was another step forward. This is um, Elowitz lab Caltech around 2008. Um, all right. What are you thinking? I wonder what you're thinking. Isn't this just bursty transcription? This is not bursty transcription. This is a bursty entry of a transcription factor into the nucleus. This isn't transcription. This is crazy one. It, it looks like this. It, the nucleus looks black green. Black. Green, green, black, green, black. Protein, the overall protein level is the same? The overall protein level is the same. It just goes into the nucleus and out of the nucleus like that. <coughs> but it's basically either all out of the nucleus or all in the nucleus. Like a two-state system that has these... Maybe size huh? Maybe it's something about size delimitation. There's a pore that allows this protein or something to go in. And, uh, so you're not asking about the mechanism. Yeah. yeah, so we'll ask, talk a little bit about the mechanism. Um, Neil Friedman, here at Weizmann, uh, studied um, a signaling cascade, which has two uh, Y1 and Y2, called NFAT1 and NFAT4. 
or two uh, almost two you say uh, homologous proteins. They look really similar. Like this happens a lot that you have a signaling cascade and then the gene duplicates and you have another gene that looks almost the same. It's almost indistinguishable. So you can ask why have why have two uh, almost indistinguishable proteins in a circuit. And when you look at the dynamics, y1 is a function of time, it has these graded dynamics. And y2 is a function of time, has these. Uh, so you have amplitude modulation and frequency modulation in the same circuit in response to the same signal. And then these two things combine to regulate the downstream gene. So one, one thing that's emerging is that these isoforms, like ERK1, ERK2, et cetera, in, in signaling cascades, can have, they look so similar, and they, they can have different, really different dynamical responses to the same signal. And uh, so that's, that's also, that's very recent. I don't remember if it's 2000. Is there anyone here from Niels Lab? No? 2013, I think. Okay. And so, so I think uh, I think we can now, after this uh, review of the biology, as it's known now, and this in the phenomenology, we can uh, ask ourselves at least two questions. One is how? What are the circuits that give you oscillations and pulses? And uh, whether we can. Uh, find the universal circuits that appear again and again that give you oscillations and pulses, Ro the question of robustness, right? How you, can, uh, how you can get pulses despite noise or maybe because of noise, etc. So we'll talk about how, and we also need to understand why. What's the advantage or the use of oscillations and pulses? We're going to try to ask uh, how oscillations in biology happen with the circuitry. And then we'll try to ask why. Any questions, by the way, so far? I told you some stories about oscillations and pulses. What do you think? Do you find it surprising? Or surprising? Okay, so um, how do you get an oscillat oscillatory circuit? So we're going to ask, what circuits lead to oscillations? And I always like to try to find uh, something uh, physical that, I, I, that helps me understand. And so when I think about oscillations, what helps me understand is when I was a kid, I had this shower in, in Kfal Saba where we grew up. And this shower um, was the kind of shower where you, let's say, try to put on the, you make, it's cold, the water is cold, you try to make it hot, make it hot. And then it gets too hot, ah! so you try to make it cold. But then it becomes too cold, you make it hot, ah! <laughs> get into an oscillatory mode. Really try to find, you try to find the right point, but it was hard to find because the, the, the response function, the angle of the, of the faucet and temperature was very sharp transition, sharp transition. And there was a delay because the thing that was killed me was the delay. You, you put it to the hot and then it doesn't happen, <laughs> you go more hot, then it's too hot. Right? But by the time you get it, it's too hot. So there's a delay between so there's two things that there's 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 three elements here, okay? So three elements in my story. The first one, the most important one, is the fact that I, uh, I'm sensing the temperature and I'm correcting. That's called negative feedback, right? Temperature is hot, I try to cool it. Temperature is cold, I want to heat it. With negative feedback. You can't have oscillations without negative feedback. At least nobody's there, ever found a way to get oscillations without negative feedback. Second thing in my story is delay. Right? Delay helped the oscillations here because I'm reading something from the past, so 
can't adjust. And the other thing is steep response curve. Because if, if the angle is very, very, like if the temperature changes with the angle of the faucet very smoothly, it will be no problem to find that sweet spot. But the, the steepness of it, the stuckness of it, made it more difficult. How many people here relate to this story have ever been in a shower like that? <laughs> okay, great. So I'm not outdated. I see that the majority, because I was worried that today's showers are maybe different and you don't have childhood experiences like that. But I'm sorry to hear that you do. <laughs> okay. Fine. So these principles uh, help me understand this abstract uh, mathematics of when, when, which circuits oscillate. And of course, you can, in dynamical systems, there's a huge literature on this. And, I, and if you're interested, I really recommend the book by Strogatz on dynamical systems for the elaborate mathematical theorems about when things oscillate and when they don't. But just, let's make it, I'll make it simple. So we need negative feedback. So I make negative feedback. We've already heard about negative autoregulation, right? If transcription factor regulates its own production. Yeah? Negative autoregulation. When you look what happens to the function of time with negative autoregulation, you usually get something like this, and you can also get something like this. You get damped oscillations. And you can't get sustained oscillations. I'm looking for sustained oscillations. And Okay, so maybe what's wrong here is um, I, I can make this very steep, very steep uh, response curve, like auto, like step function, etc. I still uh, I'll get damped oscillation. So maybe one way to correct it is to add a, de a more delay. Okay, so one way to add a, a delay is to have another component. So this is negative feedback. With two components. X makes Y go up, nice deep side of relief, <sighs> and Y makes X go down. When X goes down, Y goes down, X goes up. And when you simulate models like this, a transcription factor activates another transcription factor which represses the first transcription factors. You also get damped oscillations of the two transcription factors. I've just plotted x here. And no sustained oscillations. You can prove it. With, if, you do, if you compute the eigenvalues here, what you see is that if I plot the two transcription factors here, there's a fixed point, and it's a spiral fixed point, and things just settle down to that fixed point. X, Y, they settle down to some fixed point. All right, so maybe I even add more delay. Let's add more delay. Three components, that's even more of a delay, right? Uh, and Eureka, we get oscillations. <laughs> X goes up, Y goes up, Z goes up. When Z goes up, X goes down. When X goes down, Y goes down. When Y goes down, Z goes down. Z goes down, X goes up. X goes up, Y goes up. And we get sustained oscillations. Nice sustained oscillations. If I plot x versus y here, I get this kind of nice uh, loops. This is called limit cycle. Very nice. Uh, and there's a name for this circuit. It's called the repressilator. 
And Michael Elowitz is a, is a PhD student with Stan Leibler in 2000, built it from three, rep three repressors that repress each other. He hooked these up in the cell, so he made the transcription factor X, and he engineered the binding site for X upstream of a gene that encodes transcription factor Y that repressed the binding site upstream of the coding region for transcription factor Z that repressed. So here's also a negative three node feedback loop. And he hooked up GFP to this one inside bacteria. And bacteria went green, black, green, black, green, black. Nice deep sigh of relief. <laughs> you didn't manage to sneak up behind my back this time, but I know some of you do. That's OK. <laughs> Keeps the circulation going. And, and this paper is the, one of the founding papers of the field of synthetic biology. The idea you can build cool circuits inside cells by hooking up transcription factors. It's a big field now with its own journals and uh, conferences, et cetera. But when you look at, when you look at the cells, they, don't, they do oscillate with it's an eight hour period, doesn't matter. But they don't look like this uh, as nice as the simulations. In fact, they look like This is cell number one. Cell number two. In other words, you have very noisy amplitude and period. And you sometimes skip a pulse. Why? What's the difference between the simulations and the actual circuit? Huh? Noise. Noise. So real biology has real noise. The parameters change over time. And uh, if you try to make 1,000 proteins, one cell will make 800, another cell will make 1,200. We've talked about that. So the difference between this side and this side is noise in gene expression. And so let's, let's look at these circuits. What happens when you add noise? Uh, this is what happens when you add noise to the negative auto re regulation. And when you add noise to, the sp spare s to this situation, <coughs> noise actually gives you oscillations. Noise makes the stable uh, spiral fixed point oscillate noisily. So that's actually the one thing I want you to know, that you can have solve equations on a computer and get one behavior, stable. You add noise, you get a different behavior. Now why does noise do that? Because um, the system is trying to get here into the spiral fixed point. What noise does is it keeps kicking the system. It, it keeps kicking the system and making it not go to the spiral fixed point. What you get is that you have a, a period which is equal to this to the spiral uh, period. So if this fixed point by the by the negative by the imaginary parts of the eigenvalues has some frequency, the noise keeps that frequency. The amplitude goes like the noise strength. So the stronger the noise, the bigger the oscillations you get in this case. And that's what's called noise-induced oscillations, and they have these these properties. The more noise, the more amplitudes. And here too, why, why, why is this so noisy? It's so noisy because x has to go down, or let's call it, let's say, um, z, uh, z here. Z has to go down below threshold in order for z must go low for x to rise. So, and this, is, when you say go low, the small number of molecules, that's where noise is most important. So if you need to go low with z, you need to get down to, let's say, 100 molecules per cell, or 10 molecules per cell, or whatever. The time that you do that is really different between different cells, and therefore the next pulse, or the next x will rise with slightly different differences, and you lose your, your period and, the ampl and your amplitude. And it's basically this oscillator, the repressor is sensitive 
to noise. So we can, uh, we can refine our question. What circuit leads to oscillations that resist noise? Okay, so these, these circuits don't. And maybe another thing I want to tell you, it turns out that there's plenty of ways to build an oscillating circuit. So when you see oscillations, it doesn't give you what the circuit is. There's plenty of ways. You need to look more in careful, like how noise resistant it is, what's varying, the amplitude, the period. Do the, do the pulses look like sine waves or more like uh, asymmetric things? And many other uh, diagnostics in order to get at the mechanism. And many, many mechanisms can oscillate. And now I'm going to show you the noise resistant oscillator that is emerging as a kind of universal network motif for oscillations. And I wonder if you can guess what it is. <laughs> I don't think you can guess. Doesn't matter, you don't have to guess. I'll tell you. So Noise resistant oscillator that is at the heart of circadian cell cycle and pulsars. It looks like this. So it has this slow negative feedback. and positive autoregulation. So it's made of a positive and a negative feedback loops with temporal separation of time scales, or separation of time scales. What's the idea here? This gives the delay. This gives the, you can say, the stuckness of the faucet, because the positive power regulation gives a very steep response curve. So I'll try to explain to you how this thing works. Maybe I'll just say the oscillations in this circuit look something like this. They're kind of spike-like. They're not the sinusoidal ones that you get from the other circuits if there's large separation of time scales. And uh, these are supposed to be the same, right? So, and what I want to plot for you here, here we're going to plot x, and here we're going to plot x production and x decay. And in this circuit, what happens is that one way to build it is you make x positively auto-regulate its own promoter, right? X also positively regulate the production of protein Y, but Y degrades X. So Y is like, chain, uh, when a Y is around, X gets uh, quickly uh, killed. Or Y sticks to X and inhibits its activity, like a sigma factor and anti sigma factor. Like yeah? That's a circuit. Um, so what happens? So I'm going to pause. So what does if because X is positively autoregulating, its production rate looks like this. Because 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 X is positively autoregulating, at low X its production is low, and at high X its production is high, and we're going to make it very steep also. All right, fine. Are you with me? So this is X production. What about X removal? X removal has to do with this Y. So X removal, plot it like this. Its slope depends on Y. The more Y there is, the higher the slope. And so we have, we have something like dx dt is this nonlinear function of X. That's the production minus Y times X because y degrades x. So the slope of the removal 
This is the slope of the removal. The more y I have, the higher the slope. So let's try to analyze what's going on here. So let's start with high, a lot of y. Where's the fixed point where these two lines meet? That's where production equals removal. And we have a low level of x. We have a low level of x. Remember that x produces y. So y production, we start with a lot of y. There's a low level of production, so y goes down, down, down. y goes down, down, down. So the slope of y starts moving. Okay? And moving. And moving. Okay? Y goes down. We started with high Y, and it's going down, down, down. And X goes like slightly up, 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 as you can see. X goes up. But then something very important happens. When this Y, there's so little Y that it doesn't cross this line anymore down there. It crosses it up here. Can you see that? That's the catastrophe. That's this, what's called the bistability of X has two stable fixed points, high one and low one. But we're stuck on the low one. And then suddenly we move, and there's a catastrophe. There's no more low fixed point, only the high fixed point. And at this point, right, this is the high fixed point. High x, x shoots up. When x shoots up, y starts being produced again, right? Because x produces y. So it starts being produced, so the slope starts going back up. Starts going back up. Starts going back up. Starts going back up. So what happens to x levels? They go down. Until this point here, where the lines don't kiss anymore, and it jumps down to the low level. So what we have here is slope going up, down, up, down, up, down. And its intersection was a steep curve going low, high, low, high, with these abrupt transitions. And that's, yeah? Did the slope go down at the beginning? Um, because what I said is I'm going to put in a lot of y, and the production of uh, y is very low, so y just gets degraded away. Uh -oh. Y gets removed slowly. <coughs> and in fact, this, this remo slow removal is basically, this period of slow removal, it sets the period. So the period of this whole thing is, the first approximation has to do with the rate that y decays like that slowly. Then it hits high x, and you get this pulse-like um, oscillation. This is called relaxation oscillator. And if you add noise, Virtually nothing happens to it. I mean, noise can affect this levels a little bit, let's say, maybe go a little bit higher like this. It's period and amplitude are are very noise resistant. Um, okay, so that's that's one circuit I wanted to tell you about. So we talk about the repress later. The re it's called the relaxation oscillator. Um, It 
it's bu built into it is this bistable switch. Uh, if you try to st simulate it at home, you'll see that you'll need to, sometimes you need to add a three node negative feedback loop here so that there's like inertia, so it doesn't get stuck, so it keeps like going and coming. I have to say in general, what's, one thing that bothers me is that if you want to get uh, these limit cycle oscillations, a lot of times you have to tune parameters. So in the range of parameters of a circuit like this, there are some parameters where you get nice oscillations. And then if you change the parameters, let's say by a factor of two, you get uh, no oscillations. Or you get into a situation, which I'll talk next, which is um, random stochastic pulses. So a, a given circuit topology like this, there's numbers on the arrows, the parameters. There will be some region. So this is the parameter 1 and parameter 2. You, you, you see a region like here you have oscillation. Let's say, and here you have stability. And here you have pulses, stochastic pulses. And um, with the same circuit, by tuning the parameters, you, you, you get into different regions. That makes me uncomfortable. I don't like situations like that. I like circuits where almost no matter what the parameters are, you get a, a certain kind of behavior because I think that biology can't guarantee the parameter values. You can say it, put it this way. But that's, that's the state of the art right now for understanding oscillations. Now, um, how, do, how do stochastic pulses happen? Yeah. <coughs> Aren't there some places in the middle where you could have a possibility of two states? Uh, it could be either higher or lower. Yeah, so when, for, this, for this particular value of y, you have a two-state solution. In fact, there's three, there's an unstable fixed point here in the middle and two stable fixed points. So let's think what happens, right? So if you start low, basically you, you gradually move with the line. You move, move, move here. You, you can't jump up here all of a sudden. Unless, you know, you, you add some noise, some serious noise that brings you over. So this, this is what's called the separatrix. You have to go above this point to reach there. But if the noise isn't that big, until the line go, drops below and stops, it kisses this curve and then goes below. And then you don't have this fixed point anymore. What happens basically is production is larger than removal, and X levels go up, 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 and stop only when you hit here. So this is a phenomenon of hysteresis, actually. You, you need to have a, one slope here where you jump, and then another slope here where you jump back down. Does that make sense to you? Yes. OK. It's absolutely true what you say. And so uh, uh, I'm uneasy, I have to say. I'm, I'm uneasy with this uh, circuit. As you can see, it's, it's really, yeah. Actually, I have a question about the experiment, the Evolix uh, experiment that you described. Yeah. I think what, I, what, what you're referring to is two different types of, you refer to noise in a single cell system and you refer to oscillations when we, look, when we average a lot of uh, cells. So the Elowitz experiment was a single cell? Yeah, the, the Elowitz experiment in 2000 was a single cell experiment. And I mean, I, I was there because I was a postdoc when he was a grad student. So he, we already had GFP, I mean, uh, because GFP I think was used first time uh, for biological monitoring in 1995 or something like that. So that was five years. It was amazing how quickly it started getting into labs because it's so much fun to see fluorescent cells. So he, um, Mike Soret, and he hooked up the circuit. Again, <laughs> this, he had this idea five years before, four years before, when he was just starting his PhD. But like many ideas in the beginning of your PhD, they don't seem that smart or interesting or something, so he left it to the end of his PhD. <laughs> Still years ahead of, uh, of the field. And, and people really, I remember some graduate student walking in and saying, what are you working on? So he said, I'm hooking up three repressors to get an oscillator. And he said, isn't that a pin-headed project? You know, pin-headed, like this is a pin. Because it seemed very, very, why do something like that? But after we did it, it became suddenly obvious that it's really amazing, uh, 
ability to basically ask questions about circuits, let's say, that don't exist. You can build circuits from biological circuits, the biology that could have been, or the biology that can be, or the biology that we can engineer, right? Now we can engineer things. So he did the single cell experiments on the microscope, and he also did the population experiments in the fluorimeter, where you look in the well, it has millions of cells. And in the fluorimeter, uh, you don't see oscillations, you see damped oscillations because of the same problem that we talked about before. Cells desynchronize. They lose, their, because of the noise, they don't, they don't synchronize so well. And, and you can't see in the population average uh, oscillations, but that's why you had to look at single cells. When you look at single cells, you see this noisiness of the oscillations. And that made Michael also realize that there's a lot of noise in biology, and his next studies were about noise, characterizing noise. And very distinct. There's a question of one cell. If we try to plot a circuit, uh, like on the computer, something very clean, we'll get something very smooth. And while we measure it in the lab, we get something that is much more noisy. Yeah. So that's one type of noise that we can do. Well, by the way, we can add noise to the computer, too. Right? right. We can do stochastic simulations. Right. Okay. Okay. One type of noise that's, that's inherited in biology. Right. And then uh, another thing that we, we talk about is when we try to average cells, right. we see that even if it's they're all originally in one clone, right. but they behave differently. Right. That's, it's not necessarily the, yeah. the, the, the same kind of noise. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they originate from, they both originate from sto the stochastic nature of the chemistry, of the gene expression, etc. Cells that then have an individuality, that's it, one cell that makes growth makes more proteins per unit time than another cell, let's imagine, because it has more ribosomes or more RNA polymerase because of the first kind of noise. And then you can say that cells also have different individualities, which would mean like different parameters over their entire cell generation. So, so there is a kind of what's called extrinsic noise and intrinsic noise. And you're right, there's two kinds of noise. Um, so, uh, so here I'm talking about resisting noise, uh, which is these, um, the, when you try to produce a protein, you're basically producing some proteins per unit time, and that's a random number that's around the mean. And with this kind of thing I'm talking about, so if one cell is here with parameter, another cell could be here, another cell could be here. So some cells will oscillate, some cells will pulse, some cells will be stable. Maybe you get this situation where what's happening is that you have a cloud of cells, they're all stable. Now I increase the signal. And some cells go into the oscillatory mode domain. And that's how you can get from stability to oscillations. So these kind of uh, phenomena we need to consider. Um, Possibly originate from the same line, like uh, I think so. Uh, so the same circuit can uh, produce pulses, and I just want to mention how that happens. Um, the way that happens, we think, is what's called excitable systems. And here again, the metaphor that, that I try to think about is, is when you have a match, like in your kitchen, uh, or you know, when you light up a cigarette, or I hope none of you smoke. Or if you do, you quit right now after this class. And uh, what's a match? You, um, once you cross a threshold temperature, you get a fixed burst of energy from the ma match, right? You get this big burst of energy, and then it's burned out, and you can't do anything anymore. But let's, let's imagine a renewable match. It burns. Whoo, and after it stops burning, after a while, it gets renewed and it can burn again. Right? So this uh, situation, what happens is that in excitable systems, you have a stable fixed point okay, that you, you, you go to. But if you go too far away, there's usually also an unstable fixed point. You have to go all around to come back to the stable fixed point, like that. So if you move far enough, you have to go all the way around to 
come back. Like you, you've lit the match, okay? And then you, start, you stay here. No, so if you're here, you're here forever unless there's noise. If there's noise, then once in a while, you get, you get a, a spike like that. What, what the input signal can do, like calcium, etc., is, is move these fixed points. So it can move, let's say, this fixed point can move these fixed points closer and closer here, so noise has more of a chance to get the pulsing. So, so you go from this situation to this situation. Uh, if input signal moves the fixed points like that. So, but if, 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 this, if, if this is a random stochastic noise, uh, how can you have this periodicity in the spikes? You right. The periodicity in the spikes it has to do with the time it takes me to replenish the match. So you have a spike, and then there's what's called a um, refractory period where you can't get a new oscillation. And, you, and, and that's built into the parameters of the system. So the assumption is once the match is uh, ready to be, to be lit, it will be lit? If there's high noise. If there's high noise, it'll immediately be lit. If there's low noise, uh, you need to a stochastic event to carry you over the threshold, and then you get a situation like this. And then you get kind of Poisson statistics or something between whatever it is between the pulses. And here, at high signal, you get periodic signals, pulses, which the period has to do with this refractory period, the time it takes you to replenish the match. Did I explain myself? Did I? So the, the, the top one is when you have high noise, which means that the, 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 the small period, the, the modulated period, is the one of the, the refractory right. period, and the lower one is the... Low noise, you could say. <coughs> but in fact, we think, usually like to think that noise is constant, and what's, what makes the difference here is um, parameters change to move this fixed point, let's say, clo closer to this boundary. So with the same noise, either you cross many times or you cross rarely. So we think the noise isn't changing, but the, the input signal causes the parameters of the system to change. And that, it's like the, it's just two sides of the same coin. And All right, so we have, uh, I want to just have devoted just a little bit of time to the question of why oscillate and some ideas that are out there. Um, so I'm going to erase now, okay? If you're confused, you're not alone. Why? Let's uh, let's call this. Let's ask why pulsars. Uh, and one answer is that they allow uh, fixed ratios between um, genes. So what do I mean by that? I'll just uh, say. So we have at, again at low signal. We have this situation, right? Low signal. This is x transcription factor is a function of time. At high signal, we have something like this. So what's different is that signal increases the percent of time that transcription factor x is on, let's say, is in the nucleus. This here may be, I don't know, 10% of the time, and let's say here 80% of the time, and that increases with signal. That's what, this, well, that's what this design does. Now, as opposed, we need to oppose this to a situation like, like this. Let's say this was high signal, and this is low signal. 
where x is, uh, x is changing in time somehow uh, gradually. So this is, this is a concentration is controlled, x concentration control, or activity, right? Controlled by signal. And here, this is the AM, amplitude modulation. Modulation in FM, it's a fraction of time that x is it, so x is basically zero or one, and this controls a fraction of time that it's one. So that's very different. And let's see why uh, why FM has an advantage. So now I'm, I'm thinking that x is controlling some genes, right? Y one, Y two, Y three. X, these x's transcription usually control large groups of genes that's supposed to work together, and often. We want y1, y2, y3, etc., to have fixed ratios, like what's called in, in by, uh, stoichiometry. We want them to be in certain proportions because they make a machine together, let's say, or a ribosome or whatever. It is. So I here have y1 and y2 production rates as a function of x activity. These are the input functions that we drew, and we, they usually look something like this. This, let's say, for y1, y2. They're, they're um, usually, they have different uh, slopes, uh, whatever. Okay. Now, notice that if I'm here at low x activity, let's say I can have here a ratio of, let's say, 1 to 3, okay? 1 to 3 ratio. And if I'm at high x, I can have a ratio of, let's say, 2 to 4. 2 to 4. So you see the ratio of y1 to y2 depends on x. And that's bad because they don't have fixed ratios. In order to get fixed ratios, I have to make those input functions exactly proportional to each other. Right? In this case, however, I have my y1 and y2 input functions. x is either 0 or 1. So I have these ratios, whatever the ratios of the steady states are, let's say, whatever the ratio is, let's say 5 to 3, whatever it is, times the percent of time that x equals 1. So if I now uh, increase the signal, then y1 and y2 will have fixed ratios. Here, if I increase the signal, y1 and y2 have different ratios. This kind of control is in engineering is called bang bang control. And where, when do you use it? You use it, for example, if you have a rocket and you want to control its uh, engine uh, quite accurately, but you don't know, uh, because of uh, what's happened to this rocket, uh, exactly what's the relation between the, um, I don't know, the power you put in and how much thrust it'll give the rocket. You don't know. So what you do is you do bang bang control. You either go zero or maximum. Zero or maximum, and you control the fraction of time that you're maximum. And so if you know the maximum thrust, you can you know it. You don't need to care about the exact dependence. You go zero, and you just uh, toggle the amount of time that you go from zero to maximum. And for gene expression, you lose dependence on all the shapes of these input functions. You only need to care about the steady states, and, uh, and you kind of get a bang-bang control, give you fixed ratios of the genes. Did I explain myself? Was it clear what I said? So this is a, this is a, comes again from Elowitz. Uh, and he experimentally demonstrated this uh, on, uh, on, the, on the crazy one system by building both of these situations and, and seeing how the genes respond. So uh, that's one possible use of this kind of pulsing. Um, we talked about dynamical multiplexing, where you can have, with the same transcription factor, encode different information based on the, on the time course. So if you have 
Some genes respond to pulsing, other genes respond to oscillations, other genes respond to a constant signal. And you, therefore, if with the same transcription structure, you can get different genes. Um, there's some trade-offs, like this kind of design is, uh, this design is very accurate at high signal, but at low signal it has, it has more difficulties because if the signal is really low, you get one spike per very, very long time. And so you start getting noise again because if you don't know, sometimes you get one spike, sometimes you get two spikes, and low spike number, again, you have a problem. So this is more noisy at low signal level. On the other hand, it's accurate at high signal level. On the other hand, this, this can be noisy at high signal level and accurate at low signal level. Sometimes you want both AM and FM. And that's maybe what happens in this NFAT1 system, where you have fast responses and slow responses together on the same gene. And you can mix and match fast responders and slow responders and get different dynamical curves. I'm shaking and waving my hands because I think we really don't know uh, a really good, good reason for oscillations and pulsing. It's more, more of a mystery right now. I mean, there's maybe these explanations account for some of it. There's much more to be discovered. And yeah. Can you explain again the graph of uh, x and y? How, that, how does y and y1 and y2 go gradually up with x? This, this graph here? The one above it. This? So, um, so here we have you know, x binding to the DNA. The more x there is, the more uh, transcription of Y1 there is, more transcription of Y2 there is. And these curves um, look like Michaelis Menten or Hill curves or something. But what is more X if you only have 0 or 1? Right. Well, there's no more X. You have 0 or 1. But um, if they switch, let's say, if you're here 50% of the time, then the total transcription will be this number times 50%. And if you hear 90% of the time, it will be this number times 90%. And that's there why, therefore, if you increase the signal, which increases the fraction of time that x is 1, overall you get more y1 and more y2. But you get them in fixed proportions, because you're always hitting either 0 or this part. Did, I, did, that make, did I explain myself? So it's really good that you asked. Yeah? The, the fact that you're, you're going these spikes is kind of deceiving, because you still have some finite uh, removal time for, for x. So basically, this is a, a very long time scale. If you want to do the same thing for time scale, you are limited by the, by the removal time of x. So basically, this will, will hold only for, for very long time scales. Uh, yeah, good point. So th this argument here works when you're integrating y over time scales that are much longer than the width of this pulse. So let's say in crazy one, this pulse could be one minute. And we're asking about why that's accumulating over a cell generation, which is, let's say, 100 minutes. But if we were to look inside x, we would be stuck in this situation. Uh, what happens if we couple these signals into some sort of output? Yeah. You, you mean couple no, both of them? But the output of the circuit, there has to be coupled to some output that the cell does. Yeah. Uh, results in. You mean this? this? Yeah. Uh, I mean all these circuits that you talk about, these uh, signals. Yeah. Like, uh, right. The cell, I mean, it, within, the, within the cell, it sees these ge uh, gene expression signals. Right. But it, it couples it to an output. The cell right. does something. Right. So what happens if you look at the output? How does it uh, okay. change the so, so let's think about P53 oscillations. And P53 regulates some genes. If you look at those genes, what happens to them is when P53 is high, they get uh, regulated. And when it's low, it's low. When it's high, it gets regulated. So these genes, let's say, would accumulate like that. And then maybe hit a threshold. And then just tell the cell, stop dividing or commit suicide, or something like that. So that's, that's the simplest thing you can, you can think about. This transcription factor is pulse or oscillate. The downstream genes regulate accumulate. Mm -hmm. And after enough pulses, they've made enough steps to cross the threshold and make a cell decision. Okay. But I mean, um, has this 
decisions been also quantified the same way that these gene expression data have been quantified? Um, yeah, and so in some cases, uh, there's two, two color or three color experiments where you both see the upstream oscillator and the downstream genes accumulate. And again, um, one example is in the B cell sporulation where SPO0 A makes one pulse per generation and downstream gene accumulates and this counts five generations. It's a counter that counts one, two, three, four, five. After five generations, they sporulate. Apparently according to, to something like this. And much more difficult to make any kind of biochemical counter that counts five generations without a pulser like that because if you try to think about it, uh, noise um, becomes a very, very challenging over five years. So uh, that's one example I know of. And uh, yeah, it's kind of, it, also in P53, you can think that these are repair and then monitor whether there's still damage. If not, repair, then monitor, because some of these genes are repair genes. Repair, monitor for damage, and if you haven't done, an, if you've done enough cycles like that and haven't managed to repair, kill the cell. So this kind of, uh, it's like an internet protocol where you try to get a packet, you, you don't get it, you send again, you send it, and after a while you abort and you say, I can't do it anymore. So it's a, maybe a protocol like that. But again, all, <laughs> it's wide open, so I guess many ideas from digital electronics might, might apply here. And uh, did I answer your question about the downstream? Right, the downstream. If you have an oscillator, the downstream can integrate it or Maybe if there's a full change detection system, only when you pulse, you actually get a response. If it's a constant, you filter it out. So, I don't know, you have to, we need to integrate all the things we learned in this course to figure out how the circuits respond to oscillatory inputs. There's a lot to do.